Good morning, my name is Josh Redlin. Today is August 17th, uh, 2010. I'm in Tucson, Arizona at the Tucson Vet Center interviewing Gilbert Romero for the Voices Oral History Project. Thank you, Mr. Romero, for agreeing to be interviewed by our project. Please know that if there are topics you don't wish to discuss, uh, you will not have to discuss them. Also, there's something. if there is something you wish to discuss, we want to hear you. If at any point you wish to stop the camera to get a drink or use the facilities, please let us know. As we said earlier, your interview will be housed at the Nettie Lee Benson Library at the University of Texas in Austin, at the Austin campus. So let's begin. All right. um, tell me about your childhood. What was your daily life like? Well, it's uh, growing up, we just played at like uh, kids' games, like kick the can, hide and seek. And I was born in downtown, and uh, then in 29, uh, then uh, my father moved us to my grandmother's house on, on the north side. And there, we finished growing up there, with, there was a bunch of cousins around there. And uh, there used to be an irrigation ditch, and we used to go skinny dipping all the time. <laughs> so, like now they call it the barrios and everything. And of course, I was real fortunate to grow up with a, a lot of my friends that joined uh, Easy Company and uh, played ball in high school, chandla ball uh, growing up. And, and then uh, in June of uh, 49, I joined the reserves. Okay. What was the school like growing up? You're, you're from Tucson? Tucson, right. Okay. What, and what was school like? Well, it's, I liked it because, you know, I knew everybody. Like they say, I was born in the barrios and, and all the families knew each other, so we knew all the kids. So yeah, it was a lot of fun. I was something to you know, get out of, the, out of the barrio and meet some other people in school. But it, it was, I had a lot of fun. I uh, got to meet a lot of the teachers, which uh, uh, some of them have passed away since. Uh, but there was one teacher that was my, that I, she, I don't know if we, I liked her, and she liked me, and she was uh, by the last name of Tom. Mm -hmm. And her dad used to own a grocery store. And uh, I don't know if uh, she used to, you know, tutor me. Or, and uh, then when I got out of school, she, I used to talk to her. And because uh, I, I don't know if she passed away now, because uh, the store's not there anymore. Mm -hmm. And I never got in touch with her, so I don't know if she passed away or, or I don't know where her parents are or anything. So, but you know, she she taught me a lot of things growing up. So. Okay. Um, do you remember any of the things that you used to study or? Um... Mostly, I had this friend by the name of Ernest Salazar. And. Uh, when I was going to Roscoe in high school, now he used to be after me. Because math I didn't like, or algebra. English, yes, and, but mostly I was more interested in PE or playing ball or anything. But he used to tutor me, and he used to get after me. And uh, he started me on going to summer school and taking all like uh, algebra, history, English. Of course, they, at that time they had uh, Spanish one, Spanish two. And I, my mind used to wander and, and say, oh, I gotta play ball and I forget about, about the classes. Now after school, he used to come over to my house and, and tutor me. And then he got me to go to summer school, said this way, you'll forget about your sports. And which I did. And uh, I started going to summer school when I was in uh, Roscoe's junior high. Then when I went to high school, I had only 
one period of graphic cards and then one period of English and the rest was PE and because I took all my solid oh, oh, like English algebra I took it all in summer school and this is why I graduated in 48 I had a, my other friends and they always wondered why I graduated before they did so a lot of my friends graduated in, in 50 and they often wonder and they said, well I, started, I took a lot of summer school were, that's why did you feel like there were any special difficulties being Latino at that time to me I I, I, I never noticed that growing up because there were some colored uh, families that were in the neighborhood and playing ball I got to meet a lot of people Chinese uh, boys that played ball with us so to me uh, I didn't have any difficulty with that or anything it's in fact one of my best friends is Harold Dunn is Chinese we went to Korea together uh, played blood of ball and uh, he was my foxhole body and and he was one of the persons I saw when, when I got wounded up in Horseshoe Ridge when they put me in a chopper. He was the one that saw when the chopper took off. It was brought down by enemy fire and they settled down saw what happened to the chopper and this is why over the years I have uh, learned how I got wounded and what happened to me. So, and we traveled with Harold Dunn and, and his wife, we used to travel a lot together, but his wife passed away, and now his youngest, uh, his only son passed away. But we still get together, you know, go to luncheons and reminisce about old times and everything. So, That's good. Now, I'm real fortunate like, in that way, you know, to, to uh, you know, colored Chinese, English. And of course in 1935 when we were skinny dipping there, we had a, a colored family moved into the neighborhood and one of the boys name was John. He, he was always um, among us and he had a sister by the name of Helen. She was real light complexed, real pretty, green eyes and and that was around 1935 when we were skinny dipping. She came looking for her brother John. And uh, she called, is John with you? And John says, no, but Niggy's here. Now, and that nickname st stuck with me to this day. And a lot of people don't even know my, my real name. They call me by Niggy. Even the commandant of the Marine Corps called me Niggy. So even my, when the kids were, my children were small, they used to call me Daddy Niggy. My aunts called me Niggy. Like if you're going to hear it, some of these friends call me Niggy. They don't call me by my, my actual name. <laughs> Sometimes when they say Gilbert, I look around and see who they're, <laughs> they're talking to. <laughs> yep, some of those nicknames stick forever. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um. All right, so you graduated high school in 1948. Yes, in 1948. 48. And uh, did you enter the military right away? No. That Easy Company, 13th Inf Infantry Battalion, was formed, and a lot of my friends were joining. And I didn't join in, in 47 because I was going to summer school. And then during summer, I used to go to the ranch and uh, with a friend of mine. And uh, then my cousin, he was in the Second World War, joined the Navy when he was 16. And then when he got discharged from the Navy, he joined the Army. And then he got discharged from the Army, and he was working at a mine there in Tucson. I think it was San Javier mine. And then in, in 49, came over to the house, they said, hey, let's join the reserves. Everybody's joining the reserves. And they give you dungarees, 
boondockers, of course, and T-shirts, and all. green T-shirts were a big thing that year, and everybody was wearing them. Everybody was joining the reserves, and I joined the reserves in June of '49. Well, we never thought we were going to get evacuated in the '50. But yeah, there's a lot of almost uh, the kids from the waters that joined. Okay, well, let's talk about uh, some of your military experiences. Uh, maybe you can tell us a little bit about uh, boot camp, basic training, and and uh, where you went from there. See, when we got evacuated from Tucson, they put us on a train, and we went to San Diego. And then from San Diego, they took us to Camp Pendleton. Their easing company was dissolved. There was uh, some personnel that went to a Baker Company, some with Charlie, some with uh, 11th Marines Artillery. I went with Able Company. I never went through boot camp. When we were there in Pendleton, they put us up in, in formation and they, and they asked uh, anybody that has two summer camps, please step forward. So most of us stepped forward and a lot of this that stayed in the back, there were 16-year-olds. They were still in high school. And uh, they never had a summer camp. So those are the ones that went to boot camp with us. We thought we were going to go to boot camp, but what we did was train day and night. We didn't know what we were training for. Then uh, in 50, we made the Eliso Canyon. It's an amphibious landing. And when we got back to Tucson, they said, go and unpack your gear, because you're going back to Pendleton. And I said, what's going on? I said, well, there's a war in Korea. And I didn't know where Korea was. Well, none of us knew about Korea. So they took us back to Pendleton, and we trained, and then we boarded the ship at Noble in San Diego. And, uh, and they say well, the, the scuttlebutt was that we're going to land in Hawaii, and with her, we're going to train there. But when we got, got close to Hawaii, they said, no, you're joining the, the convoy of ships. And God, I've never seen so many ships in my life. And, and we bypassed Hawaii, and then halfway to Korea, I said, you're going to Korea. And nobody knew where Korea was. And... Uh, like, we, we didn't have any training, like, you know, like boot camp. What we did was all our training was in a poor ship, was to fire our, our weapons at flying fish or targets or whatever. And uh, when they said, we're going to land in Kobe, Japan, and that was in September the 1st. And we landed there in just enough time to put all this ammo, gear what we're going to use to land in in Korea and that September 1st we hit a typhoon and when we were docked at there was a bunch of warehouses and when the typhoon was over we came on top of a, a deck and looked out there was no warehouses they had just blown away there was just a just a cement where they were in the foundations where the warehouses were and then from there, we boarded, well, we took off, and they told us we were going to do an amph amphibious landing in Incheon. It's September the 15th. And uh, it was drizzling, and then when we got down to the, close to Incheon, we could see all the ships flying towards Korea or Incheon and Woodby Island. And uh, some Marines, the 5th Marines, and I think the 7th landed in Woolby Island. And we landed in either, we landed on Blue Beach, which was a wrong beach. So we had to board the boats again and come to Red Beach. And this is where we used the ladders to climb over the seawall. And that was, that was quite an experience. And of course we cut up some rounds coming in. And then from there, we went down to, 
Yang Dampo. But uh, before we got to Yang Dampo, we passed through Sosa. It's a small village there. And uh, as going through the rice fields, this Korean, he popped out of this foxhole and he was right in front of me. And it scared me and I moved back. And he said, Sur, Sur, meaning that he was a South Korean. But then I looked at his, at his feet and the Koreans used like little sandals. Or, and right away he had boots and I knew he was in a, a South Korean and he was a North Korean soldier. So I ran out and he had all his weapons in his foxhole. And then I got him and took him in. To, they took him away, I don't know where, to interview him and everything. Then in Yang Dampo, that was a big battle we had. We got hit by, by five T-34s, the Russian tanks. And they were about 25 feet from us in the levee. And every time they fired, you could hear the shells go by, and then you could hear it fill the heat after that. Uh, they were that close. But like I said, we were up in the levee, and the turrets couldn't go high enough, so they were trying to fire over us. And some of the rounds hit in front of us, so we had to jump over the levee. So, but then they came out with a with a bazooka, and they knocked two tanks out, and the the, the third one just it was hit, but it, it didn't catch fire, and then they disappeared on it. That was then in the morning after the tanks hit us. And, in the morning, we got hit real heavy by, by infantry. And I think uh, there was about 250 uh, North Koreans that we killed. And, and we had some casualties there. Then going into across the Han River, we got hit again. And the Baker Company was at the, by the Han River there. And uh, they got hit pretty heavy. And those were the first. I think it was the second and third casualties from Tucson. There was uh, Emilio Ramirez that got killed there, and then uh, uh, Sergeant Pitts, Anthony Pitts, was taking care of uh, Emilio, and uh, at that time he was alive, and Pitts was taking care of him, and Pitts got hit in the head, and uh, they, I guess they sent him back to the the board hospital and uh, later on he got hit on the head again the P sergeant pitts got hit uh, in the head again and i'm not sh too sure if he has passed away or what uh, but i never saw him again i never saw sergeant pitts again so but it's it's like we're all kids and you know you, you go in there and but after your first big battle you know, you grow up, and you never know. It, it's scary. It's scary, and you can do a lot of praying on it. But that was a young Dampo was a big battle, and of course, then we crossed to the Sioux. And there was another Tucsonian that was killed there by the name of Carrasco. He got shot in the head too. And, So you, it sounds like you had to grow up pretty fast there. Oh yes, uh -huh. like they, you know, there was an article written on, on us on Easy Company. They say they went as boys and they came back as men. So. Okay. Then of course, uh, we fought in Central Korea. Then we went up to the Chosen Reservoir, which, uh, where most of us got our those frostbite on our feet or hands on a lot of, lot of uh, Marines that were with me and have you know, lost their legs, their hands. And so, so it sounds like Easy Company was made up of mostly uh, Latinos like yourself yes, from uh -huh. Tucson? Yes. And when you uh, went to training and they kind of separated you guys and you went over, did you end up Serving with mainly Latinos, also, did they put you back? Well, most, the most of, in uh, in our platoon, there were ten from Tucson that belonged to Easy Company. Baker Company, I think he had eight that were Easy Company. 
and then the 5th Marines, I don't know how many they had, or 7th Marines, and then some went into the 11th Marines artillery. And, uh, but we used to keep in, in contact with, you know, there, there's some that were with motor transport, and they come down and bring us gear or what we needed, and, you know, they give us information about, a, like, the 5th Marines, 7th Marines, and they were doing fine and everything. And so, well, we always had contact with, with everybody. And so, then we met some Latinos from uh, from LA. That's so. all right. Earlier, you were talking about. Um uh, when you were hit and when you were going to be evacuated by the helicopter, do you feel like talking well, about that a little bit? Well, before that, in Central Korea, we were going up this hill, and they let us go up this hill, and this North Koreans came out of their foxholes, which were camouflage, and, and they hit us from behind. And I caught some shrapnel behind the my legs and my butt and my back. And uh, that was in uh, April. It's the first time I got hit. And they sent me to the field hospital and they patched me up and just sent me back. And it took me a day and a half to get back to my outfit. And for a whole month, I couldn't lay on my back. I had to lay, sleep on my belly. I couldn't sit down or anything. And I was just getting over that. Uh, I felt good you know, laying on my back. Then uh, we got a, what they call is a, went up to Central Korea there, and they called it a Operation Killer. And the Chinese had broken through, and they ordered us, or oh, Able Company was ordered up to that Horseshoe Ridge to clear out the Chinese, because that was one of the highest mountains there. And uh, of course, they, they wanted us to clear the mountains so, because it, there was a lot of, I think it was a fifth Marines that were on the right flank and, and uh, but they were lower and all this Chinese were firing down on them. And then when we started going up there, I was trying to set up my, my BAR to look where, where they were firing with machine guns. I was trying to locate their bunkers or anything. That's when I got hit right through the chest, uh, my chin and it shattered my chin and knocked most of my teeth out. And as, as I was going down, I got hit in my upper chest again. And it hit me right there and it came out on my side. And because uh, we got hit real hard at that time, I thought we had about 50% casualties. And then when they started bringing in the choppers, they put me in that chopper because they said, they thought I had been hit in the lungs and you know, spitting blood and everything. So that there was a little bubble helicopters, and they got two uh, uh, stretchers on the sides. On it. And uh, when it took off, they, it was brought down by enemy fire. It didn't crash land, the Cyril Dan told me. It just fluttered down. But they blew it up so that they wouldn't get anything from there, you know, Chinese or whoever. And they blew it up, and this lieutenant, walked out with Abel Company. And this is what Earl Dunn uh, was telling me afterwards. And uh, this lieutenant walked out with a company. And, uh, and there's an article in one of the magazines that I got. It tells you the story about this lieutenant. It was 24th trip taking out these Marines. And that's what happened, uh, that he got shot down. So he walked out. And there's an article there in one of the books I brought. So, and so, but when I got hit, they brought me down in a stretcher from the mountain and they put me in a truck. And going to the field hospital, they ambushed a convoy. And I got hit right through my thigh right there. And another one went through there. And they cleaned the, this pocket of Chinese. So the convoy started again. And further down the, the road, they ambushed a the convoy again. And then I got hit right through there. Again. That is unbelievable. And then when I got to the aid station, 
there was a corpsman from Tucson by the name of Jimmy Fisher. And uh, when they took all the bandages off, when this side was hanging down, and, uh, and Jimmy Fisher recognized me. And he said, oh, I know him. He's from Tucson. And uh, he asked the doctor, what's he doing? He said, he lost a lot of blood. He won't make it. So from there, and uh, his wife has sent him a scapulary. That's a religious metal. And he couldn't put it around my neck or anything, but he put it in my hand. And I say, this is what saved me. It's a, it's a saint. His wife had sent him, had sent these a week before. He said, Jimmy, that's the only thing he could do was just put it in my hand. And as you can see, as much as I bled, there's no, there's no blood on them. But when I got to Japan, they say they had to pry my hand open, because they were in my hand. And they were curled up. But now with all this time, they had straightened out like that. And they asked me, why don't you wear it? I said, I'm scared to lose them. Now they say when on the, from, from the field hospital, they, they just patched me up and they'd send me to Yokosuka because they, they couldn't do anything there at the field hospital. But on the way, on the way down, they say I died. And they brought me back. And I didn't know this until well, you know, later on at, when I was in, in Babuaneva Hospital. The Marines that were with me told me all this, so, like I say, through the reunions I have attended and through friends that were there, they tell me how I got wounded, because when I got hit in the chin there, it just, I was out. I never knew what happened if, if I got hit through the chest or legs, but all these reunions and that I attended or friends that come over and they, you know, they tell me what happened to me. Like I say, I'm, I'm lucky. Yeah. Sounds like you had a little help from above, one way or oh, another. Oh yes. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm, I'm really glad to be doing this interview and to hear your story. I feel very honored, and thank you for your courage for telling us that, that part. I know that's probably difficult. When you came home, were you able to? Talk to friends and family about uh, your experiences. Uh, uh, I was having a hard time. Yeah. Uh, I had all these operations and everything. Now it's uh, when I came out. You know, it's. I got married in '53, and uh, I was still having a lot of problems. You know, it's just going through. Uh, like a lot of us, you know, started drinking and everything. And to me, to me, that's, that's the only way I could get my head cleared from this, I'm trying to get a, a, away from what happened. And uh, gradually, I just realized I was hurting my family. And I said, what? Well, and I'm killing myself. So, and I just said, I'm just going to quit all this. I quit smoking, I quit drinking, and, and it was hard. It was hard to try to get back to civilian life. But I, I still, once in a while, I, I, I started uh, thinking, and, but then I, I go talk to my wife. And, uh, she gets me out of that. Mm -hmm. Been married uh, 56 years. So. Congratulations. Yeah, but, those are very, very difficult memories, I'm sure, to think about. You no, know, in, uh, in April, I'm going back to Korea and, uh, for five days. And uh, then we're going to go to China for 10 days. Uh, so. And, uh, you know, they asked me, why do you want to go to Korea? And, you know, we're always kidding. And 
He said, well, look for my teeth. <laughs> <laughs> That's a, and uh, when, I, when, when I was in Yakuska, uh, I was out for about two weeks. And because they, they patched me up and uh, I had to, had to recuperate there. They were going to send me back to the States. And there were some Marines from Tucson that were there. They went to see me. And uh, I had an M on my forehead. And uh, when I, we were in Babo Naval Hospital, they came over and said, well, when went and saw you at Yokosuka, but you were out. And I said, do you, do, do you know why, why you had an M on your forehead? I wasn't thinking at that time. I couldn't talk because I was all wired up. And I said, no, shook my head, no. I said, they used a couple of choice words. And so, they, so they would know you were Mexican. That's why they put a name on your forehead. <laughs> now, and when, when they give you morphine, when they give you morphine, they put you an M so that they won't overdose you with morphine. <laughs> so, so they said, and, uh, and, uh, and this one, uh, I served with this. At that time, he was Captain Barrows. Uh, he was a career man. And uh, he became 27th Commandant of the Marine Corps. Now it's. They used to call him the Southern Gentleman. He's from uh, St. Francisville, Louisiana. In uh, 07, we went to see him because he, he had heart problems and he was uh, had other problems. And uh, the first day he saw us, he recognized me. He said, hey, Niggy, how are you? Fine, sir. Skip. He didn't want to be called Commandant or anything, Skipper. The fine skipper. And Rimmon is. Next day, we went, we went for breakfast. We saw him there. Went to, How are you, skipper? Didn't recognize any of us. Now, his son is a, a retired lieutenant colonel. And he says, Even with us, my dad, we walk in the house, he'll recognize him one day. Next day, he says, Who are you? That's how bad he was getting. And uh, even his son at the banquet, we had the pleasure of sitting with a skipper on the main table. There was a lot of brass there. And they had a table for us with our name. And there was uh, Harold Don and Bert Rincon from Tucson that we were with Able Company. Harold Don was attached with us from heavy machine guns. And we sat on our table, and this lady came over, and she said, you can't sit here. And we wonder why. And then she said, there's a special place where you're going to sit. So we stood around, and the skipper, his son, and his other son came in. The other son is a professor. I think it's in uh, South or North Dakota. I can't remember right now. Well, anyway, he said, you're going to sit with a skipper. And a lot of, he had a lot, there was a lot of brass there. You know, all this, with blues and a bunch of medals and everything. You know, these ladies were, the wives were with beautiful gowns and everything. And, and here's this, two Mexican and a Chinese <laughs> sit with a skipper on the head table. But we never got the dirtiest look. <laughs> so we said with the skipper and the lieutenant colonel. And lieutenant colonel is a Robert Burrow Jr. He sat next to me and he says, leaned over and put his arm around my shoulder. He said, do, do you mind, Gilbert said, do you mind if I call you Niggy? He said, no, everybody else. My dad's always calling you Niggy, talking about Niggy. So he started calling me Niggy, this retired lieutenant colonel. So that banquet's over, and, and 
this lieutenant colonel and said, we got to take Dan because he's getting tired. We've got to put him into bed. As the lieutenant colonel got up, he kissed my wife on the cheek. And here's all these ladies, beautiful gowns with all their colonels, lieutenant colonels or whatever. And all the wives are sitting. And he says, I'll be right back because i got to say good night to all of them. The brass are. So he walks over, and here's this lady going like this. <laughs> and when he shook her with her hands. <laughs> and then she turned around and looked at us. Oh, my God, it looks good. <laughs> but, uh, you know, that was, you wanted not us there. So, you know, that's, that's how much he, he cared for us. And one of the letters I got, he was here in, 19, in 1995. We had a naval company reunion here. And uh, my wife and I walked in, and he was standing with us. There was some personnel from Davis Mountain and some other personnel from the reserves. And, and they had all their blues, medals, and everything. So going by, he turned around and said, Niggy, I want to talk to you at the hospitality room. I want to get rid of this brass, and I'll talk to you. I said, fine, sir. We went up to the hospitality room. I never had so much diet, Pepsi, and cashews in all my life. We sat there for about two and a half hours in a sofa like that. My wife was on one side, he, the skipper was in the middle, and I was on the other side. And he had his arm around my shoulder. And he was asking me all these questions, you know, about where he knew all our nicknames from Tucson. My cousin that I joined the reserves, his name was Henry Valdenegro. Okay. Some of them, some called him Black Buck. Some called him Val. And, and when I, before we got down to the Chosen Reservoir, we were in Chinghani. And uh, it was starting to snow, and it was real cold. And the skipper called all the squad leaders. And of course, I had to interpret for my cousin, because he, he used to stutter a lot. So we were out of, outside his, the skipper's stand, and uh, he heard my cousin talking and stuttering. And he said, Romero, is Val out there? Yes, sir. I said, well, send him back to the foxhole. Sir, can I inquire why? Said, well, he can't talk English, he can't talk Spanish. They might mistake him and shoot him for a gook. <laughs> <laughs> See, my cousin in Spanish said, I'm going to kill that so-and-so and so. Now, in 1995, when we were sitting up here at the, at the hospitality room, he remembered all this. And he said, what happened to Val? He said, remember he wanted to kill me because I told him to go back to that. <laughs> so at the hospitality room, the door was like that. It was open. Nobody could come in the hospitality room because he had his aide there on the door. He said, don't let anybody in until I tell you. Of course, they, there was beer, sodas, and snacks there. Everybody wanted to come in and get a beer or something. And his aide, Jones, he said, nope can come in because of skippers here. Afterwards, they said, how does a corporal rate that a commandant has his arm around him? Because I'm a good Marine and he likes, he likes me. But we spent two and a half hours just reminiscing. And I got some pictures there when, that I took on it. But, you know, I really like that skipper. He really, and one of the letters is, uh, when he retired, he says, I still get calls to go to Mexico. And in, 90, in 1995, he told me, I like the mariachi music. So I sent him some mariachi tapes. So he wrote to me on this letter, and he states, oh, I still get calls you know, to, uh, for speeches at different bases. Or, and he says, in every area, uh, uh, how did he phrase it? Oh, every chance I get, I talk to my Mexican-American Marines. They were great. So I sent one to, the, uh, to uh, Chronicle. We were there in Chronicle for another reunion. But I, uh, he had passed away then. 
And I told him I sent him this. I, 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 they got a library with all this. And I told him I had this letter from him. Oh, he says, we'd like to have him, because there's a big picture of him. There was the 27th Commandant of the Marine Corps. So I sent him that letter and so But everybody liked the skipper. He was, he had the southern draw and all that, so. But it was real nice. And was he your uh, platoon leader in Korea? No, or? He, yeah, he was our captain. The captain, yes. oh, okay. He was our captain. Uh -huh. They brought him in from China. In fact, there's some pictures that he sent me. Uh, uh, I asked him to, in 1995, I asked him to send me a picture when he was coming down to the Marine Corps. And uh, he, at that time, he was living in Florida. And uh, he was going to move back to St. Francisville, Louisiana. And he said, well, when I'm back, I'll send you a picture when I was commandant. And he passed away and never, never got the picture from him. OK. So were there any other things that you wanted to talk about as far as the uh, military experiences or wartime experiences? Well, just before we got to Sioux, I can't recall what what hill. Just before we get to Sioux, there's a hill nine something. I can't recall what it was, but our company was the first one to raise the colors there. Just before we got to Sioux, and there's a picture of the skipper in front, and I can't I can't remember who raised the flag. When it's just a piece of uh, they broke a branch of and hung that that American flag there. There's a picture of it that I got there. And I took that picture to him. I had it enlarged. And, but somebody else had sent him that picture. And he's got a, they got a museum for him across the Mississippi, and, uh, which we had the honor of. They opened up the doors for us, because uh, was, they were still putting up his pictures and all this. And it wasn't ready, but to honor us, Abel Company served on there. They opened the doors for us so that we could see how it was going to be set up and everything. It's, uh, but in Korea, it's, uh, they, uh, most of us were lucky. Like, Abel Company were, we took a lot of pride in serving with a skipper, and he helped us a lot. He was real friendly with us, you know. Uh, he, uh, even in his later years, he, you know, he write to you, you know, and you appreciate those things. Okay, let's uh, talk a little bit about uh, life after the war and after the military. Uh, sometimes today they call the Korean War the uh, Forgotten War. Forgotten War. Yeah. The conflict. Maybe, police action. Yeah, maybe you could talk a little bit about that. You know, uh, I have met a lot of Second World War, Korea, Korean, Vietnam, Iraq. Uh, I've been in the hospital since 1952, and I have met a lot of patients there, like Vietnam. I met Iraq veterans. They're young like we used to be. And uh, I have met a lot of Vietnam veterans that, that are still bitter what happened to them. Some say they didn't get a parade or anything. And I tell them, you know what? I fought my war. I didn't get any parades. I came by myself. What I did, you know, I'm proud. Maybe you were treated wrong. But to me, I don't look at it this way. I joined the service. I served. I got wounded. Yes, sometimes I'm bitter about that. It's like you gotta live with it. 
there's a, it's hard to explain. Each individual is different. To me, when I came home from the hospital, I came in a Greyhound bus. The only people that were there were my parents. That's all. Besides, I didn't at the time, I didn't care if I had a parade. I was just happy to be home. And I guess I was been, let me tell you a story about this. When I was in Babonewa Hospital, there was a nurse there. She was a, she served Second World War. She saw a lot of young Marines get killed, a lot of, get maimed. And there were seven Marines from Tucson in Babonewa Hospital. And one time, she, I was there over that weekend. I couldn't get any liberty because I had surgery. And she came over and she said, let me tell you something, son. I hear you're always kidding around with the rest of you. The Marines there, said, that's a good thing. And she says, don't ever feel sorry for yourself. Once you start feeling sorry for yourself, you're gonna pay for it. I took, I took her advice. This is why I kid around. When I start feeling bad, I start kid, kid around with, a, with the other guys. And I tell a lot of these Marines that I met one uh, from Iraq that was wounded, and he, he was kind of low, you know, feeling kind of low, and. I said, what's the problem, son? Well, I got hit and, you know, I was a ball player and I don't think I'm going to... Son, I used to play ball. When I came home, I tried. I played glove ball as long as I could. Don't give up. Don't give up. Think, of, think about your family. And I said, don't, don't ever give up. Don't ever start feeling sorry for yourself. And he said, I never thought about that. So he thanked me for that. But I learned it from this nurse. And, and uh, I gone through 29 surgeries. And uh, the last one, I, I nearly died. And uh, I was really, they thought I was going to die that day. And I was really depressed. And I told my wife, called the doctor, tell him to cut me open again and see what's going on. And just to, she said, don't die on me. And I said, well, why? She says, if you die on me, I'm, I'm, not, I'm gonna miss the government checks. Now that brought me out of it. <laughs> <laughs> She said, but you're going to get something, honey, but not that much. <laughs> so that brought me out of that depression. You know, it's... So your, your wife's got a good sense of humor as well. Well, you know, she's learned all this, that I that have uh, mentioned all this. And, you know, she's, I, I've gone through a lot of surgeries, and she's been there for me. And she knows how to take me out of depression and everything. Mm -hmm. but, but that time, you know, we still laugh about it. Because you said, oh, I was really going to miss those <laughs> government checks. <laughs> and uh, she's gone through a lot of things. And uh, she's a cancer survivor. So so both of us have gone through a lot of stuff. So been married 56 years. So, you know, she takes care of me and I take care of her. Sounds like you're a lucky man. Well, um, I think we've done pretty good. Is there anything else that you can think of that you'd like to talk about? No, it's, 
I guess that covers everything. But like I say, like in April, we're going to go back to, to Korea. And my wife would like to see where, you know, where we fought and everything. And I like they tell her, you know, there's some, some Marines that have gone there. And they say, it's, well, it's a beautiful country. Mm -hmm. to, and, but they say it, the way Sioux has built up and all those towns, and it's really something to see. It's like stateside. And, uh, and I told my wife, you know, when, when we were there, it's, all the, the villages were, were burned out. So it was destroyed, and all, you know, it's, we never saw any, like, I belong to the Korean Association. Now they give us, once a year they give us a dinner, and there's speeches, dances, and everything. And there's some pretty Korean women that come out as models, and, and I say, I never saw anything like that. <laughs> <laughs> any pretty girl, girls. I said, well, maybe we didn't have time to look for them. <laughs> <laughs> now my wife tells me, just take a good look, that's all, that's mm -hmm. all, just take a good look. <laughs> Maybe you'll see some on this trip. But you know, this is one thing that's always stood in my m mind. Going through these villages, seeing that it's all burned out, and seeing these little kids out in the snow, barefooted, hardly any clothes. Ah, uh, that's... To me, to this day, I can't stand my grandson, my great-grandson, granddaughter, with any clothes, but warm clothing. I get so mad when I see them, you know, when it's cold, that that's me. Mm -hmm. I can't stand to see them without any sweaters or anything, and I tell my, my granddaughter, put that sweater on, but it's not the cold. It's just in my mind that I saw this, and I don't want my grandchildren to suffer this cold. And it always stuck on me, watching this little girl, boy, walking around, you know, asking for candy or food, you know. It, it stuck in my mind. I, I don't think I'll ever forget that. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the only thing that's, that made it hurt, you know, remembering all that. Mm -hmm. and another thing that I saw Marine get hit in the face and I always prayed, I hope I never get hit in the face. <laughs> and the first thing I do is get hit in the face. <laughs> but, you know, that's, that's life. Could have been killed here by a car. You know, there's been some instance that, you know, the Korean veterans come, come home, car runs over them, or they die in some other accident. You never know when your time's up. Like they say, as much as I've gone through, he says, your time is enough, is enough. My wife says, you've only got eight and three quarters lives left. And saying, be careful with your other, because you, you're just like a cat, you know? nine lives and that's it. <laughs> <laughs> and she likes to kid around with me, you know, that's so. But. All right. Well, I guess we'll wrap it up. All right. Well, uh, thank you. Thank you. Can I call you Niggy? Sure. It's been a, a true honor. I My thank pleasure. You so much for uh, letting me interview you today. And uh, thank you. Listening to your story is incredible and very inspirational. I hope uh, many others can benefit from listening to this as I have today. Thank you very much. <laughs>